Well, thanks everyone for tuning in this Choir Nerd podcast. Uh, it's been a busy summer and early fall, as it tends to be with people in the arts. Fun fact, over the summer, our Aro Pert CD was featured in a French horror movie. And uh, that clip you heard at the beginning of the podcast was featured in the film. That's pretty cool, huh? French horror movie. Maybe our new bread and butter. I've got a great guest on today. Her name is Dawn Padula. She is a mezzo-soprano and associate professor of voice at University of Puget Sound. She's got an incredible list of solo roles under her belt that uh, you can check out on her website, which I will link in this podcast description. What interested me the most was her work on issues with the male passaggio. Unfortunately, due to time constraints, we weren't able to focus specifically on the techniques to help one negotiate the passaggio area, but uh, we do talk about how the voice works generally and uh, talk about what parts of it are in our control. I do recommend taking a voice lesson from her if you are interested. I thought it was refreshing to have a lesson from someone that doesn't only focus on imagery. She is a technician and clearly very knowledgeable about how the voice works, and I hope you find this episode helpful. Okay, without further ado, here's Don Padula. Thank you, Don, so much for coming on my podcast. Uh, we just had a lesson, and uh, it was fabulous. <laughs> so what I want to talk about is just really the basics about how the voice works. Okay. And I want to talk about what we what control we have over it. Okay. Um, so maybe maybe you could just give us first, just generally speaking, how how the whole thing how the whole thing works. So every instrument has uh, three things that make it go. So and, and sorry, and sorry, yeah. just to quickly. Sure. And I'm going to post a photo of uh, the voice box, so you can, if you want to start, if, if you want to say uh, use some the larynx. terms and stuff, that'll be that's totally fine. Okay. okay. Um, so yeah, so every instrument has um, what we call an actuator or a motor, and then we have an oscillator. And then we have a resonator. Um, and this goes for every instrument. So, you know, for example, uh, a piano, you know, the, the actuator or the motor is the hand hitting the keys. And then the oscillator is when the hammer hits the string to vibrate. And then the resonator is the, the body mm-hmm. of the instrument. And therefore, you know, the larger, um, the more resonant space you have, the more sound you have. So the larger the piano, the bigger the sound. Um, so the voice is no different, although everything is housed inside of the body. It's not an external, um, instrument. As we all know, it's an internal instrument. The, um, the actuator of the vocal instrument or the motor is the breath and the breath mechanism. And that fuels, um, the air. We actually control the air coming through the trachea, which then, uh, the larynx or the voice box sits on top of the trachea. And inside of the, um, and the larynx is actually a very small yet very complex um, set of five cartilages, one bone, and several muscles. Mm-hmm. Um, and there are external muscles, and there are internal muscles. Um, they all work together to, to make things function. But basically, um, the vocal folds themselves um, are, are open when we are not making any sound, but they are closed and vibrating when we are making a sound. And mm-hmm. so, um, if you're familiar with orchestral tuning, A440 means that in order to make an A on, uh, an A4 on the piano, you are, uh, the sound is vibrating at 440 cycles per second. Well, that means the vocal folds in order to sing that pitch or any pitch above it is vibrating at 440 cycles per second. Um, etc. So um, the vocal folds vibrate through a combination of muscle activity, um, elasticity, and aerodynamic activity, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, I could really get into that, but I don't know if we have time. <laughs> uh, but it's called a myoelastic aerodynamic event for vocal fold oscillation. So that happens at the oscillating um, 
level. And then finally, we have the resonator. And for the voice, the resonator is um, basically the, what we call the vocal tract. It's all the spaces that live above the larynx, okay. um, even above the vocal folds themselves. So above the vocal folds into um, the top of the, like the, the, the top of the, behind the tongue and in between the larynx and the tongue and then between the the tongue and the top of the mouth and then into the mouth itself mm -hmm. so those are all the resonant spaces and that's for example um, if you know what a trumpet looks like and you see how it has a very fixed tube and that's that tube um, is the free resonator of the trumpet um, the voice because our tongue moves and because our soft palate moves and our jaw moves the voice tube uh, or the resonator changes all the time. Mm -hmm. It's never in a steady uh, position. So mm -hmm. that's what makes it very, um, uh, the, makes the, the sounds very unique and interesting, but also it makes it um, a challenge for a singer to maintain resonance over a wide variety of pitches and things like that. Great. So yeah. Cool. So uh, um so the first the first part was the breathing part, mm -hmm. and a lot of teachers um, really focus on that. I would say disproportionately more than the rest in my experience. Okay. Um, do you you know? And it sounds like it's it's sort of one of maybe two or three other several things. Yeah. yeah. Um, how how do you think about the breathing part, and how important is that? Right. So. Um, so let me back up for a moment. There are there are actually five systems of the voice that we do talk about when we're when we're teaching lessons. We talk about the the breath management or the breathing mechanism, and then phonation, which is, you know, actually what happens at the vocal fold level. Um, resonation, uh, sorry, registration, mm -hmm. um, which is it's a combination of what happens in the vocal folds as well as resonance, and then resonation, and then articulation. So, all those things work together, obviously, yeah. to make singing happen. Um, but I will say that the breath is, again, it's the motor, so it's mm -hmm. the foundation. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're in a car and you push the gas and it doesn't work, the car's not going anywhere. <laughs> so t that analogy is that basically a lot of a lot of teachers want to make sure, I'm sure, that the, br the breath mechanism, which is really the foundation of everything we do and really is in charge of everything that we do, is in a good place, um, perhaps maybe before going on to other things. But different teachers approach this in different ways. You know, some teachers will talk about the breath and breathing and give exercise for it and then move on to other things and then remind the student that you must be thinking about the breath while doing these other things um, and, you know, and then go back to the breath and revisit things if needed and then go back to the new things and then go back over here. So you've got a lot of like multitasking and coordinating to do as a singer and then as a teacher, it's your job to kind of make sure that the student is keeping in mind the various things that they need to be thinking about in order to create, um, to make progress. Um, I liken it to plate spinning, <laughs> <laughs> where you spin that first plate, which usually is breath, and that's plate spinning, and then you add the next plate, and then, oh, you gotta go back to the breath, hold on, spin it, and then you gotta back to the other spin. Okay, then you have the third spin, and then you have the second spin, and the first spin, and so my point is, is that there's a lot of like, reminding yourself of touching base on certain things. Um, and then when you're performing, you have to like have enough experience performing to know where does my brain go when I'm performing? Mm -hmm. and how can I draw some of these things, uh, make these, some of these activities more second nature yeah. through practice or, so that I can do these things successfully in performance. So, oh. Mm -hmm. oh, I didn't answer your question about how the breath works. Would you like to say oh, no. answer? <laughs> Well, I, I, I was more, th uh, no, I, you did actually, because okay. I, was, I was trying to get a sense of um, how important you think the breath is, and it's it sounds like it's super it's important. It's super important, yeah. Um, how, so what always baffles me about um, the voice is how, uh, at least physically, similar it looks than different, okay. um, but we all have such unique voices. Mm -hmm. um, so what, what accounts for... Um, like someone's actual tone like what makes someone sound so different from another person even though they have physically nearly you know identical features right. um yeah that's fascinating so there's a couple of things at play um everyone's um first of all everyone's larynx is 
probably slightly a little bit different. Everyone's vocal folds themselves are slightly a little bit different. Mm -hmm. But more so than that, everyone's resonant uh, vocal tract is is different and unique. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what's going to give different sound uh, qualities. Um, the length of the vocal folds will also change sound quality and timbre. Um, but definitely the resonance system is probably going to give the most unique sounds. Uh -huh. I mean, if you were to... Um, there's some really cool stuff on the internet if you ever want to look on YouTube, but um, the vocal folds, if if the neck and the head did not exist and you blew through the vocal folds, yeah. they would basically sound like a duck call, you know, yeah. like, you know, yeah, like, that's cool. like a non-descript sound. Yeah. And if you oscillated that duck, duck call at, you know, 440 cycles per second, you would get an, a. Get an a. So then you'd have to if you put someone's head and neck on top of those vocal folds, this is really gross, but if you <laughs> put someone's head and neck on top of those vocal folds, that would make the sound quality totally change because the sound waves are going to be bouncing through that person's vocal tract in a slightly different way than they're bouncing through someone else's vocal tract. Mm -hmm. So it's not just a fundamental frequency that we're going for, but we're, it's a complex um, array of frequencies that are being enlivened by different people's structures head and head shape and vocal tracks so it's like a combination between the the space in there and and maybe the flesh i think the flesh itself vibrates. and yeah i mean you know um you know if you if if a manufacturer makes makes trumpets like on a on a I don't even know if this happens but on a um like a conveyor belt mm -hmm. and they're all made exactly the same well, those trumpets, their timbre is probably going to be the same because the yeah. resonance, the resonant bell is the same. Yeah. Um, whereas like a Stradivarius, you know, if it's like a handmade violin and perhaps it has different wood or a better quality, this is handmade and it's put together a little bit different. Maybe that tone will still be that of a violin, but maybe the tone might be warmer or yeah richer or something so it's similar to to how the voice is that's what because everyone looks so different you know basically their internal structures are different interesting mm -hmm. i imagine someday in the future people with that want different voices will be able to like alter oh, things goodness. in their head <laughs> i don't know about that <laughs> i think they have to do a lot of altering to do that <laughs> just then drill a hole let's here let's not and do that <laughs> hmm. what about what about range what affects the range that we have um, so the laryngeal sh size, uh, and the length themselves of the vocal folds, um, also the, um, so the tenor and baritone instrument is an inherently, um, is a biologically male instrument mm -hmm. and the shape of the, the thyroid cartilage is at a different angle in the front than it is of a, a, a mezzo or a soprano, um, when a, when a male goes through puberty, the voice drops, right? Yeah. It changes. Well, the, that means basically the thyroid cartilage, the shape of the larynx is changing. It's getting bigger, and the larynx is, um, the, the thyroid cartilage in the front is pointing more. So what that does is it shortens the length of the, the vocal folds. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's also an inherently larger larynx. So that affects range. So that's yeah. why the... Um, the male voice sings an octave lower than the female voice. Um, there's more flexibility in the female voice as far as range is concerned because the thyroid cartilage is at a different angle, allowing it to stretch forward a little bit further. Mm -hmm. um, also, the vocal folds are, are shorter. Um, they're shorter for they're, bases? They're, they're, uh, sorry, they're actually shorter. Well, the larynx itself is just shorter for, for women in oh, general. Oh, okay. So uh, smaller yeah. for women. Um, so it's not necessarily about vocal fold length, but it's more about vocal fold flexibility. Mm -hmm. And that has to do with the structure of the larynx. And that has to do with the, um, the tilt of the, the, or the, the, the notch of the thyroid cartilage and how um, angular it is or how obtuse it is, basically. Interesting. Yeah. Can you, um, I've heard of voice therapy and mm -hmm. people taking hormones to deepen their voice. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think about that as, let's say, um, a singer wants a lower voice mm -hmm. and they want to take drugs to get it or hormones or something? Is that um, a safe way to do it? Does it really work? Well, um, I don't have as a ton of experience in this area. There actually are um, 
lots of speech, speech language, patho- language pathologists who are now specializing in uh-huh, this. Uh-huh. Um, and I, I worked w- with just a few singers who have gone through um, hormone replacement. Generally speaking, and this is very general, um, if a biological male takes hormones to become more feminine... Usually, if that person has already gone through puberty, mm-hmm. the change on the voice is not very significant. Because mm-hmm. um, really, the changes have already happened. Yeah. Um, conversely, if a biological um, female um, takes hormones to then become more masculine, actually, the larynx does go through quite a bit of change. Yes, I think I've noticed that too. Mm-hmm. Um, so basically, uh, the hormones can um, cause that person to go through what would be a typical puberty um, mm-hmm. of of a you know of a biological male mm-hmm. went through puberty. Interesting. Mm-hmm. What have you heard of men wanting to take hormones to make their voices lower, like from a tenor to a bass? You know, I have not. I've not heard of that. I've not heard of that. I'm willing to be your test subject. <laughs> <laughs> Just I've not heard of that. I don't, I, and I really would have zero idea as to the effect or whether that would work or not. Yeah. Um, general, generally speaking, once you've gone through, you know, if you're biologically a male and you've gone through that puberty, my idea, my, my thought would be that you, that like the changes have happened. So that's your voice on the other end of that is what your voice is going to be on the other end of that. Mm-hmm. Um, and you're either a tenor or a bass or a baritone or a mix of one of those things. Um, but I don't know. I would, I, and I don't know. I'm not a proponent of that necessarily. I, yeah. I am definitely more of biologically your voice is this. And so, you know, train what, what you have. Yeah. Um, but, um, uh, I don't know. Yeah, okay. I'm, I'm, I mean, I, I don't know. I would say for sure um, do that in consult with a medical <laughs> professional. Yes. And not, not on your own. Yes. <laughs> but I would be willing to, you know, work with that or whatever, whatever result of that was. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the things that interests me about um, reading your, your biography was uh, that you specialize in the male Passaggio. Right. And I guess one thing um, that interested me is why why not the female Passaggio? And um, and maybe just talk a little bit about what you've found out about it. Sure. Um, so when I was doing my doctoral dissertation um, or coming up with a topic, I was studying with a tenor and um, a really well- uh, respected and uh, long career tenor um, who got into the field of vocal pedagogy um, and voice science and was very interested in um, basically he said to me he said if if you want to be marketable especially in the collegiate atmosphere as far as being a female voice teacher um, there's a lot of colleges that only have one full-time voice teacher on mm-hmm. faculty, mm-hmm. Um, and you want to be proficient in training all types of voices. Um, and the truth is, is that because biologically the male larynx is very different than the female larynx, what I do to sing into in my high voice or to go up, you know, from my middle voice to my high voice is almost 180 degrees opposite of what a male needs to do to go up in his high voice. So um, dissertation topics are usually very narrow in focus. So for me to do both ends of that, um, like males teaching females and females teaching males, it would have been a huge project that I didn't necessarily need to undertake. You know. Yeah. Um, so it was more fascinating for me um, as a mezzo soprano to um, become proficient in and really, really understand the um, the tenor and bass passaggio, mm-hmm. um, and so that was why my focus was that. Um, also, can you uh, yeah. can you briefly just explain um, what the passaggio is? Sure. So, um, registrationally speaking, tenors and basses um, sing in their chest, what we call chest voice, uh, for lack of a better term, mm-hmm. 
And then when they get up towards the top part of their voice, they start incorporating elements of head voice. But there is a large period of transition there. Usually it's about four or five semitones. Um, it's not just one or two notes. That's different than a female voice. Female voice is usually like one or two notes for a passaggio. Mm -hmm. But for males, it's like a long period of time. And it's usually in a, in a part of their voice where a lot of literature is written and they're mm. asked to go into that part of their voice constantly and with ease. Um, and so training that part of the voice is key. Knowing what to do in that part of the voice is really key. Um, and it's definitely a more complex process than that for, um, as far as vowel modification is concerned, than that for, uh, a, say, a soprano or a mezzo. Um, the majority of the mezzo and soprano voice is in head voice. And then there are nuances there, of course, to get into chest voice and nuances to get higher into head voice. But the male voice is mostly in chest voice. And then there's this th huge area of transition before it goes into head voice. Mm -hmm. So that's, mm -hmm. it's a little, it's definitely um, different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How much time do you work with um, men uh, versus women? Do you find that you are spending a lot of time helping men with the passaggio? Um, I'd say the passaggio is a, 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 so registration is a, is a big part of what we do in the, in the voice studio for the male voices. Um, I'm not going to say that we don't spend any time on that in women either. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there are plenty of registration things to iron out and the, um, especially in the Segonda passaggio for females. Um, and, um, so I don't know if proportionally it's hugely different, but it is something that's very unique. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and that every every singer who's trying to classically train themselves um, or know how to sing in the classical technique really needs to be able to uh, manage mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to have success. I, I want to just briefly switch gears out of the passaggio. Sure. Um, what makes us vocally tired Ooh. and what can we do about it? <laughs> Ooh, there are a myriad of things that can make you vocally <laughs> tired. Um, I really, I would suggest um, that anyone who's a singer grab the little manual um, written by um, Dr. Sadaloff called 50 Ways to Abuse Your Voice. <laughs> it's literally like a small kind of manual and it's you know page after page of if you would like to abuse your voice, do this, do this. I mean, there are so many things that we do. Um, I would say probably one of the main culprits is not paying attention to how we speak. Uh huh. Um, so it's the same pair That's of vocal folds. Um, you know, when you sing, you're really thinking about what you're doing. You're really thinking about technique. But when you speak, you don't think about it. But you're using the same vocal folds for both activities. Um, so a lot of people have either talk too much throughout the day or um, talk too loudly or use vocal fry or mm -hmm. use glottal onsets. Um, don't know when to take like vocal naps and rest your voice and not saying any anything. Mm -hmm. uh, I will say that as a teacher and a singer, that it, I have to really, really be conscious of how much I use my voice in mm -hmm. a day and how I use it when I'm using it. Right. So especially on a day where I you know teach several lessons in a class, or might have a meeting, then I have a rehearsal after. You know, you've got to be really, really careful about usage. And then maybe for the rest of the night, I don't say anything. Mm -hmm. You know, I rest because the only way to really, truly rest your voice is not say anything. So I would say probably the biggest culprit is the speaking voice. And that's usually what gets pe people into trouble. Interesting. And and really the, the best main cure for it is just sleeping. Or, re or just not talking. Just not talking. So vocal rest means not making any sound. Mm -hmm. Using that pad of paper or that app on your phone and yeah. having that be talk for you you uh -huh. know I've gone through many periods where I teach all day and I'm, I'm have a really important concert coming up have a lot of rehearsals and my husband just knows she's not talking yeah. <laughs> for the rest of the day or the morning I'm really saving it yeah for when I need it yeah so um and it makes a huge huge difference 
yeah. a huge difference. Uh, so that, I would say that would be the number one culprit. There's lots of other things like diet and lack of water and lack of sleep. And mm-hmm. you have to basically treat yourself very athletically. Yeah, yeah. In order to have success as a singer. What's the biggest thing you think problem maybe that singers face that you work with do you do you does that question even register as a as one (laughs) yeah you know everyone is everyone's journey in the voice studio is so individual Mm -hmm. so i it's hard to kind of say oh you know the number one problem is this and that's what actually makes it very interesting to teach a a studio of especially I, i teach mostly undergraduate students and it's really really that's really in their majorly developmental years so it's really great to kind of take them through that journey but I would say you know at the beginning everyone's kind of working on similar things Mm -hmm. foundational things yeah but then as the voice gets people get more proficient or have a better practice regime than someone else or um you know or maybe you're just quicker at coordination or whatever or still have challenges of coordination then everything really starts to change yeah so then you're really on you have to you know, be like, okay, I'm meeting you here today, and I'm going to meet you over here today. So I think it's just very um, individualized. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What? How good? Let me try to frame this question uh, well. Um, there are. Um, I meet a lot of singers who take voice lessons, mm-hmm. and 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 they all seem to have sort of varying expectations of what you know they can, what they'll what they can get uh, by taking voice lessons. Okay. And, um, you know, some people have really huge expectations. Like, I'm going to take voice lessons, and then I'm going to be this huge opera star, and right. I'm going to sound like Pavarotti. Right. So that's that's obviously an extreme example. Right, right, right. Um, but what do you think um, realistically people can expect out of um, long, you know, out of taking regular voice lessons? Well... I always say it's a two-way street. <laughs> so the teacher is there to, um, to, to again, like meet you where you are and to set goals and to keep moving you towards particular goals. Um, but practice makes permanent, you know. So mm-hmm. if a student is not in the habit of really, really practicing the things that they learned in the lesson or that they're supposed to be working on in the lesson – then you can kind of go around in circles for a little while Mm -hmm. um, where that one thing, and it's not, and again, voice is very not linear. Voice is very curved. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you can go way over here to fix something and then you need to go back again and do something else and then go back over here. So, um, but a lot, and sometimes it has to just do with, you know, the, the voice itself, like not everyone's going to wind up like Pavarotti, (laughs) you know I mean? It's just like, there are limitations to, to, everyone has l- certain limitations, um, and I think it just depends on. It depends on um, the compliance of the the student themselves mm-hmm. with the things that the teacher is saying, and also um, at the same time, the teacher hopefully continues to um, kind of like up up the ante and like, mm-hmm. no, no, let's continue to build this way. Yeah. But it's, wow, it's such an individual, again, you know, it's, <laughs> there's nothing more individual than voice study. Yeah. Um, so, and you've, sometimes you've got students with all of the like gusto and, um, work ethic in the world and, um, and, you know, maybe their voice is just, just going to be at a certain place mm-hmm. and that's perfectly amazing and wonderful. Yeah. Um, it just, you know, like, Kind of finding as a singer, you have to find what am I, what re, what do I do really well, mm-hmm. um, and how do I work towards being the best at that thing? And it's maybe different than so and so or so and so. Right. And there are so many things to do with the voice that being Pavarotti is not the end all be all for everyone. Right. You know, so kind of finding where your niche is and just in embracing it and right. like trying to be really awesome at that. Cool. Yeah. That's what I would say. Good. Um, well, I think that's really all I've got. And I just want to quickly look at Facebook here to see if anyone sure. bothered to post any photos uh, or questions. Uh, looks like not. Oh, wait, just a bunch of hello, Dawn's, <laughs> Laura. My old students. <laughs> all your old students. Shout out uh, from Laura Larson, Caitlin Emerson, Ruth Schauble, and yeah. Karen 
know Karen? I don't. I don't directly know her. Okay. But, um, she loves you. But so. she, yeah, she may have seen me in a, a couple of things. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, before we sign off, uh, where can people learn about what you've uh, about your passaggio work and about um, maybe your methods and and other than taking a voice lesson, which I highly recommend you sure. do. So my the the I will will put a caveat in here that you know nothing that I have said or write about is not it's not is unique to me. Right. All, you know there are right. amazing books written about all of these things and amazing pedagogues um, who've preceded me and all of this information is out there in the world. Okay. Um, so uh, my particular dissertation, which is very um, academic, mm-hmm. <laughs> is uh, I think you can get it through interlibrary loan mm-hmm. or um, I think it's uh, in the ProQuest, uh, actually the Library of Congress, I think has like a, a digital copy that you can get through interlibrary loan. But okay. it's, uh, I'm the, it's the only thing I ever wrote uh-huh, uh-huh. that's published out there. So okay, okay. My, you can get it by I'll, my I'll, last I'll name. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, I'll, but I'll again, link. I, you know, everything in there is basically like a review of the literature that was written on training the male voice, and you know, and then how m- males actually describe their process, and then um, looking at how f- female teachers were dealing with that issue in the studio, and mm-hmm. you could see where there was there were some disconnects there between. Um, what female teachers were doing in the studio and what was written about it and what the males were doing. And so basically mm-hmm. the idea was to collect all the information and try to um, to aid yeah. teachers who are struggling in, in finding that information. Yeah, that's great. Mm-hmm. I mean, and, and one thing that, that has been really uh, refreshing to witness is um, a more sort of anatomical approach to right. um, voice right. te- uh, teaching and instead of imagery, you know. Yeah. Um, um, so I think that was, uh, for those of you that didn't get to hear our lesson, uh, <laughs> super helpful. So um, Yeah, and focusing on the anatomy and physiology is kind of makes it, it's less... Um, Magical. Magical. It's yeah. more like, well, well, the reason you're hearing that and the reason you're feeling that is because X, Y, and Z is happening. Yeah. yeah. So, but imagery that does have its place for for certain okay. as, yeah. as well as as long as usually the student and the teacher understand where that's coming from. And mm-hmm. so here's what's happening physically. But you, but if you think of this, maybe that's useful in practice. Right. You know. Right. So. Great. Yeah. Well, thanks so much, Don. Cool. You've been most generous with your time, and of course, uh, hopeful it was see my pleasure. each other again soon. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thanks.